Vikes now. I am Dustin Baker on the mid November, November 15th edition with the six and four Vikings. If you can believe that, I have Josh Fry, who is the boss man at Purple PTSD. How's your week treating you, sir? It's good. Always good coming off another win. Um, there was a little bit more stressful than it probably needed to be down the stretch, but hey, win's a win. We'll take it. It's been a good week. I really uh, hoodwinked myself into thinking, all right, this is going to be the time where they finally beat somebody's ass. And then I think maybe 15 minutes removed from that sentiment or a tweet that I had about it. I was like, oh, no, this is, we still got this DNA where it's going to be unnecessarily close. Before we jump into this uh, today's topic about the win streak, what happened? Did the Saints figure them out? Is that what the Saints do with adjustments? I mean, it, it was probably the most Jameis Winston half of football I've ever seen in my life where he makes these absolutely ridiculous throws uh hitting at perry on that crazy catch and then that <laughs> touchdown that he threw across the field it was like the most ill-advised throw you could possibly make but somehow he sneaks it in and then he tries doing it again and he throws a couple picks where the vikings are able to find finally seal the deal and yeah I, I feel like that's just the kind of thing you're going to get out of Jameis. i don't even know if the saints really made much of an adjustment it was just wide receivers downfield out physicaling some of these defensive backs that are a lot smaller and Mikai Blackman, even Byron Murphy, who's only 5'11". And when you got guys like Chris Olave, who's not huge, but he's definitely bigger than Blackman is. And then A.T. Perry, six foot five, and all these guys that are just massive going downfield. Uh, it it was it, it it didn't really even feel like the Saints made much of an adjustment. They just got lucky a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on those two plays you mentioned from Perry and Olave, it was uh, it was there wasn't like poor coverage or they didn't the Vikings didn't drop the ball. It was just like otherworldly receptions from those two dudes. Right. And I mean, kudos to them. You, you can't make it up. They were they were wonderful. All right, so the the Saints are in the rear view. The Broncos are up next. Historically, this feels like a type of game where the Vikings would would drop it to only because it's on the road on the AFC West. And I don't have wonderful vibes about this game. And I, I sadly will probably pick the, the Vikings to lose to, you know, bring this win streak back to earth. But today's topic is this win streak and how it came out of nowhere, dead in the water in week five, lost to the Chiefs, even though that game was encouraging. You can hang with champs. Uh, and then they went on a win streak. So any any positivity that one might have had exiting that game was was true. So I want you, sir, to give us four of your, four of your biggest surprises. I don't care which order you rank them in from this win streak. What do you got? Uh, I think number one just has to be Josh Dobbs and how he's controlled this offense coming in. It, obviously, what happened in Atlanta was just outstanding from him, especially in that second half as they made that comeback. And then last week, after finally getting a week to prep for a team with this Vikings offense, he went out and threw a career high for rece- uh, for passing yards. I think he was at 268 by the end. And then a few more touchdowns. And just the fact that he's been able to come in, command the control of the offense and just be able to run it beautifully and almost to perfection at times. Uh, it's been really shocking because a couple weeks ago we were on this show <laughs> talking about who should they start? Is it Josh Dobbs? Is it Jaron Hall? Is it Nick Mullins? And I think we kind of came to the general consensus that we'd rather have Hall or even Nick Mullins ahead of Dobbs um, for the next few weeks. And just the fact that he's been able to come in and Atlanta has career high rushing yards, <laughs> New Orleans, he has career high passing yards and, the dudes just come in and, and fantastic. And I think that's the biggest, that's the biggest surprise for me right now. On this show Monday, when I was on a solo trip, I told the audience that I believe you can certainly disagree. I think we need to start viewing Dobbs through a lens of a QB one, at least entry level. And then depending on the coach, whether it's Kyle Shanahan or Kevin O'Connell quarterback whisperers that he can be sustainable as a QB one. Do you still have paranoia that he will revert into that QB two? I I think you'd, I think it'd be a little uh, early to say that I don't have that type of fear because we've seen him over the past couple of years. He has those weird games where he just turns the ball over a ton. And even that (laughs) Atlanta game, it got started with him turning the ball over a lot. And then he figured it out down the stretch. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think I have to say that I have a little bit, a fear that that could happen again, whether it's Denver, whose defense has looked a lot better over the past three weeks, and that's a big reason why they're on their own winning streak right now. Or I I don't think it'll happen against Chicago, but Las Vegas, what happens when he gets Max Crosby in his face (laughs) and he has to go up against that type of pressure? I feel like one of those games can still happen. Maybe I'm wrong, and he's just 
uh, he's just the guy all of a sudden after being a journeyman for the past few years. Um, but yeah, I, I I think it's a little early to say that I don't have that type of fear in me right now. That's fair. One thing we need to remind ourselves based on the last two games and depending on how long uh, the good games last is the moment Josh Dobbs has a turd. It's not the end of the world. He's already proven right. through two games that you, know, you, you got a pretty sweet deal with this trade and quarterbacks have turds. The best of them have them. And then Kirk Cousins was good for one or one and a half per year, like clockwork. So I think you'd have to see two to three games back to back where Dobbs turned into a pumpkin again. Um, I want to ask you this. Let's say this hypothetical, let's say this continues. The Vikings finish 10 and seven or something like that. Let's say they win a wild card game and then they lose in the divisional playoff run. I don't think they have Super Bowl oomph because they haven't been able to run the football. And usually you need to do that to be a real player in this league. If they get that far, um, does Kirk Cousins come back on this team or do they roll with Dobbs on a Geno Smith like deal and draft the next guy? Or what do you what do you make of the the future for Kirk Cousins after seeing what you have from the ass the past or not? I I think that the the Vikings preference would probably be to have Kirk back for at least one more year, uh, especially if he comes in on like a $20 million deal and he's in the bottom half of QBs that are paid in the league right now. Uh, it it, it kind of all depends on that type of contract for me and what he can get on the open market and what a team like maybe, I don't know, San Francisco would give him, or I don't, I, I don't even know who else would be on looking for a QB at that point. But yeah, I, I, I think that, Kirk Cousins is probably the best answer right now because I truly do think that with Cousins in this offense and his ability to move the ball uh, in what he's done this season, I think that this team could be a Super Bowl contender with how the de- with how the defense has been playing. Um, so, yeah, I think I think Kirk Cousins is probably number one for me right now. Uh, on ESPN.com behind their paywall, they had a, an article about, you know, fantasy buzz and rumors around the NFL. Dan Graziano and Jeremy Fowler were spitballing where Cousins could end up. And one of them said the Falcons, which checks out. The other said the Packers. And I was like, oh, yeah. boy, that would be a ride. <laughs> so uh, you didn't hear it here first, but it was relayed to uh, the guys and gals out there that uh, Kirk Cousins evidently could play for the Packers if Jordan Love, that they didn't believe in. A couple of weeks ago, the Packers general manager talked about Jordan Love and it was just an indictment. It was like, well, the next 10 games are really important to see what we're going to do. It's not usually what you'd say about your your franchise quarterback. So we shall see. It's it's weird that the Packers struggles are just a complete footnote to the Viking season. And I love it. All right. What's your next biggest? So we got Dobbs at the top of the list. What else you got for biggest surprises of this win streak? Uh, I, I think Ed Ingram is got to be on that list with how he's done in pass protection. I, obviously last year he went through a ton of struggles. He was one of the worst pass blocking guards in the entire league last year. And basically looked down the line in terms of pressures allowed PFF grades, all the stuff, uh, wind share rate, all that stuff. And it, it it's really turned around, especially over the past couple of weeks. Uh, this season, the season he, over the first five weeks, he was still a guy that you couldn't really rely on as a really reliable pass protector. He was, below a 50 and PFF in two of the first four weeks of the season. And then things started turning around. He posted a grade above 70 against the chiefs. And now over the past, over this winning streak, he's just continued to get, get a lot better. And over the past two games, he's only given up one total pressure. And if that's what you're going to get out of your right guard, I will take that out 10 times out of 10 on a weekly basis. And yeah, this guy's really starting to turn things around and really proving that he's worth that second round pick that the Vikings gave him. Yeah, go figure. It took a it took a young football player rookie into his second year to finally find his footing, and he may not be a bust after all. I will never, ever understand how, and I say this all the time on the show, how some fans or folks just are ready to skewer or criticize a rookie or a general manager when they haven't even seen more than a season and a half football. So Ed Ingram appears to have turned the corner. You know the coolest part about this offensive line? Find which guy of the starting five is going to leave next year for sure. Exactly. Yeah. There isn't one. (laughs) Yeah. That's the one. I mean, I guess in theory, Reisner could sour on the team because he's a free agent, but that's not going to happen. Derisaw is going to be locked up for the long haul. O'Neill's already under contract. Uh, Bradbury is inexpensive and in the driver's seat. And then Ingram is here for at least two more years. So the 
coveted offensive continuity plus supremacy that we've dreamt of for a decade is here. And I think that's a testament to the offense first head coach and the front office. So we will take it in and it doesn't even matter uh, who the quarterback eventually is. If you have an offensive line that is gelling like this, man, the sky can be the limit. What is number three after Ed Inger? Did I cut you off there? Nope. You're good. Uh, right. Yeah. The offensive line, it's, it's, it's been incredible. And like you said, I think continuity is a big part of that. And mm-hmm. just having the same five guys, it, obviously Reisner is replacing Cleveland, but he was, I feel like he was a little bit of a better fit and he's probably going to be more inexpensive. Um, But yeah, offensive line is great for number three. I think some of the things that Mikai Blackman and Andrew Booth have been able to do over the past few weeks and pass coverage have been just outstanding. And I, I know Booth, he was, he was, again, a guy kind of written <laughs> off after he got selected last year and then he had his struggles and then eventually his season ended at, with a torn meniscus, which injuries were the big red flag on him coming out of college. So I kind of get why people were a little bit concerned with that one. Um, but he's done with the limited opportunities that he's had this season. He's done some really great things. He had that pass breakup against Chicago, the force of punt, which ended up being pretty pivotal in that game um, to, in terms of the Vikings winning. And then Blackman, he's only played 170 coverage snaps, but he has five pass breakups. And over the past, uh, I think it's the past three weeks, he's been targeted 21 times, only 11 receptions allowed. And he's got an interception. He's allowed one touchdown. And he's been, with those five pass breakups, he's top 15 among all quarterbacks in the entire league with, while playing less than half the snaps of a lot of those guys that are at the top of the list and among rookies. He's fourth in PFF grade. It's, I think he's fourth in opposing passer rating allowed as well. So out of, getting that out of a third round pick in his rookie season, if and with limited opportunities, not really being able to get his feet wet a ton at the NFL level, but it, when he's riding the bench behind some of these other starters like Byron Murphy and a Caleb Evans, who's also had a really fantastic season. All of a sudden, the Vikings cornerback room, which has been over the past few years, a bunch of veterans at the end of their prime sort of patched together. Look, do you think about the end of Mike Zimmer's tenure and with guys like Patrick Peterson, Mackenzie Alexander, all these guys, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden the Vikings have three really promising young cornerbacks in their room right now. And they have an opportunity to build around them. Yeah. Bashad Breland came to mind there too. uh, In the 2021 (laughs) season. Yeah. The coolest aspect of everything you just mentioned about the cornerbacks is you have the three youngsters plus Murphy under contract for one year after this, which means when we get to your favorite time of the year, not far away draft time, We need not just study up on every single cornerback because they have to take one early. Uh, If this continues, I mean, assuming Blackman or I guess Booth don't have a catastrophic injury, the cornerback room, at least per the development, is set. If they want to add uh, another one in the fourth, fifth round, great. But when we get to quarterback time, we can probably focus on the necessaries like quarterback, like edge rusher, which they haven't drafted in the first round in almost 20 years. And then this guy will probably be asking for a running back somewhere in round two or three, uh, because we've kind of seen how you can get away with a committee, but the committee has to be semi-productive. And I'm very glad to have cornerback off the list because it often felt like the twilight zone, A, because Mike Zimmer loved him so much, and then B, after he and Spielman draft him, whether it was due to strange and tragic circumstances, none of them really worked out. It's cool to have it in the bag, so to speak, um, for next season. All yeah, right, so, I, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, I think – actually, I lost my point all of a sudden. So you go <laughs> ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to recap your three and then get into the final one. Josh Dobbs, out of nowhere, a, a trade that looks marvelous. The Vikings got him and a seventh rounder for a sixth rounder. And it, it's not like the, the Cardinals got fleeced. They had Kyler Murray coming back, and they were going to play him. So they were like, eh, well, we're going to get something for him. And then uh, you had uh, Ed Ingram showing up and doing the thing after a lot of criticism. And even remember, I was like week two or whatever. He's like, I feel like I'm playing pretty well. We're like, no, you're not. Uh, (laughs) And he was on to something. Uh, His technique, at least, was there. And then third, second to last, would be that the young cornerbacks have shown up. And on top of Byron Murphy's, I guess, veteran acumen, he isn't playing great, but he's getting a little better in the last two weeks. What is your final surprise of the five-game win streak? Yeah, so I mean, when Marcus Davenport went on IR, the big question was who is going to step up as another pass rusher alongside Daniil Hunter to continuously put pressure on opposing quarterbacks. And 
DJ Wanham has been the guy to do that. Uh, after a pretty slow start to the year, all of a sudden, the past three weeks, he's recorded 16 pressures. And during this win streak, he has four sacks, which equals his entire total from last year. And he's <laughs> already up to the same amount of tackles for loss that he had last season. Um, and yeah, just after a slow start, when Marcus Davenport went down, this guy has really stepped up and been a complimentary piece alongside uh, Daniil Hunter. And I think part of that is... Brian Flores just being a wizard on the defensive side of the ball and being able to scheme up a whole bunch of different things uh, to make sure that he's putting guys in their best position to succeed. And the other is just the fact that he's willing to step up in a contract year. He needs to have a really good season, and he's done that over the past few weeks. And one of the coolest parts about Wanham, in my opinion, is that all things considered, he used to be kind of a joke on run defense. It was like, yeah. yep. And then most people, whenever he got a sack, people were like, that was situational. You know, he got lucky and it's like, all right, whatever. And now all of that is vanquished. Uh, the run defense is there. I don't know where that came from. Probably a Flores special. And then, you know, he's thriving against teams not named the Bears because he used to just be the secret assassin that, you know, sacked Justin Fields, which was really cool. We'll take it. But now he's the entire product. Um, on this defense, he talked about Flores being a wizard, and that came to mind. On this very show, I want to say in the summer, I told you I'm paranoid that Bill Belichick and the Patriots are going to flounder. Belichick's going to walk away, and Flores is going to take that job. Allegedly, there's only a handful of teams that Flores would jump at a head coaching spot, and I'm going to guess one of them is probably the Patriots since he spent 15 years there. So I, I did have that take, that bold prediction, so to speak. I hope that's wrong. Um, or I hope that some underling under Flores will, you know, fully immerse himself in the final 10, what, what seven games now are we down to? And learn it because we don't want to have like this one hit wonder and then we're back to, oh God, the defense isn't that good. Do you think that with this personnel, if Flores does take a head coaching gig, that it can, you know, kind of emulate this year into 2024, whether it's Durante or whoever the uh, defensive coordinator might be? I I think it can. There's definitely the pieces in place, and I probably wouldn't have said that before the season started, but mm -hmm. with guys like Cam Bynum, Josh Metellus, and even Jordan Hicks being able to step up and take on the roles that they have this season, if we get another guy who – has the same sort of philosophy as Brian Flores. I know philosophy isn't everything we saw with Ed Donatel last year. It didn't exactly work out. <laughs> um, but I do think that if you get a, a guy similar to Flores, maybe it's an underling, like you said, who's already on the staff and can just kind of run back the same sort of stuff that they've been doing. I think it's definitely possible. Um, I need to see what happens in the draft. I, I kind of going away from the quarterback thing in that okay. first round. And I really think they want, I really, I really want them to go get an edge rusher in that yeah. first round, just as a, Another just solid piece, again, alongside Daniil Hunter, who can just rack up the pressures and sacks when Hunter's not able to get to the quarterback right away. Um, so, yeah, I think if they add a few pieces, there's definitely a path forward with this squad right now. Yeah, they haven't taken an edge rusher in rounds one or two since Erasmus James in 2005. And, man, that's a long drought. And that's not like a huge indictment. They've they've found ways to cultivate Everson Griffin or trade for Jared Allen or get Daniil Hunter out of round three. So it's not like, what are you guys doing? It's just that it's probably time to get with the times. So I have two final questions for you, good sir. Jordan Hicks hits injured reserve for four weeks, which means he'll be eligible to return on Christmas Eve at home against the Lions. In the meantime, what is your prediction? Who gets more snaps, Brian Asamoah or Anthony Barr? I think it's Anthony Barr. Um, I, I'm i really intrigued to see what he can do in a Brian Flores scheme because essentially, I mean, if you really look at it, he, is, he should be ideally playing like the exact same role as what Jordan Hicks has been doing over mm -hmm. the past few weeks. And during his prime, when he was in a system that really allowed him to blitz a lot, he he was incredible for the Vikings during his prime. And obviously, he's a little bit older now. He's been on a few different teams now. Um, I, I I do think that he's probably going to be a little bit slower than mm -hmm. he was uh, during during his heyday with the Vikings. But I do think that he's going to step in and be that guy for the Vikings moving forward. And then my final thing is there are such strong parallels to 2017, whether it's injuries, whether it's the winning streak, uh, the the journeyman quarterback. If I told you, because I did this on the show Monday, if I said, God, this feels a lot like 2017, what would be your primary? Yeah, but. Um, I I really think it's the running game. Okay. Um, they 
I, I need to see them be able to string a few weeks together. And maybe it's maybe it's with the addition of Josh Dobbs that they're able to get this thing going a little bit more. And they have over the past couple of weeks. But uh, I, I really need to see some some more out of the running backs. And maybe Ty Chandler is able to take on that RB1 role and be the guy that we've been hoping he's going to be over the past couple of years and sort of be that prototypical uh, workhorse in the backfield. Uh, he had a few nice plays on Sunday, but it, it needs to be a little bit more consistent and Obviously, Alexander Madison is probably going to be out this week with his concussion. So we're going to be able to see it full. We're going to see we're going to be able to see all the Ty Chandler snaps this weekend is what it really feels like. So this is going to be a really nice primer, I guess, for the rest of the year to see if he can actually take that leap moving forward and carry the Vikings into the playoffs. They've got four dudes not named Alexander Madison, and I'm guessing he won't play because of the concussion protocol. And you mentioned Chandler. Last week, Kane and Wongu got a couple carries. Dwayne McBride is marinating on the practice squad, and then Miles Gaskin is back. Is there somewhere in there where one of those guys can get like four yards per carry and that when you're up 27-3, to three, you can move the chains and end the damn game? Or do you believe we're just going to – I mean, who has the best shot of being a quasi-bell cow the rest of the way? Is it Chandler? I think it is Chandler just because I I love the burst that he has yeah. out of the backfield. It it looks so much different than when Alexander <laughs> Madison gets the ball. And I mean, not to knock on Alexander too much here, but I, I think that Chandler just has a little bit more of that speed that you need to find those holes in the, in the offensive line and really just pick up those extra yards. And he's not an easy tackle either. Like mm-hmm. we saw him break off a couple pretty nice runs last weekend. Um, but I, I also wouldn't mind seeing Dwayne McBride, especially down in the red zone, get a few of those touches because he's, he's the exact power back that I feel like this offense needs down there. And they haven't really been that productive down in that area in the running game so far this season, it, it's picked up a little bit with Dobbs being able to break off a few of those nifty touchdown runs that he's had. Um, but I would like to see McBride get in there in those red zone areas and try to try to break one through into the goal in, across the goal line because that's been an area of struggle. And I don't think Chandler's really that guy but with him being a little bit smaller. And he, I think you utilize him more in the open field and then hopefully get McBride down in the red zone. And that was Josh Jobs pointing to where he was going, uh, yep. presumably just for shits and giggles. I think he probably was calling out a block that wasn't going to happen, but uh, that was hilarious. Uh, on McBride, we'll have to, I have to assume that maybe he had some was hampered a little bit during the preseason because to me he did not look like an NFL running back uh, during the preseason. He looked like a fullback. Uh, so, and there's no way that you would watch the tape coming out of college and think, well, yeah, he's just slow and they're drafted him just because. So I'm hoping that if he does see the playing time or they activate him from the practice squad for a game or two, that will be like, oh, OK, there was something goofy in the preseason because there were some fantasy heads out in the stratosphere that said in June, like, you know, get this guy for your dynasty. He's going to end up taking over that RB room. And you don't say that just for for kicks. Uh, do you think there's any way that McBride – just had a poor showing in the preseason. I I do think that's part of it. I I also wasn't really on the whole McBride hype where he's okay. going to take over the running back room. Uh, I I think part of the reason he was so productive in college was he was playing Conference USA football at UAB, so the yeah. competition wasn't exactly the <laughs> the greatest in the world. And that that team's kind of always been really good in that conference, and mm-hmm. they've kind of outmanned everybody else. So. I, I I do feel like that's part of it, but again, I, I think you're onto something with that fullback thing because he's kind of that's kind of how he's built. He doesn't really he's not necessarily the fastest guy in the world, but man, that dude can bowl over some defenders, and that's that's really what got a lot of people on him uh, coming out of the draft was his ability to break through tackles, and I think that's like I said something that the Vikings could use down in that red zone area, and I think that's kind of the answer right now. It'll, I'll be super curious in these remaining games to see if he gets some touches. Um, yeah. I, I'd say it's a coin flip, maybe leaning on no, because they have Gaskin, who's more experienced. Uh, but he's he's attached to the roster for the next three years after this, so there's plenty of time. All right, sir, I kept you, kept you over time. I'm not going to press you for the pr- prediction because we don't know Jefferson's status. However, that will be published from the whole group of Vikings territory on that website uh, probably Thursday afternoon or Friday afternoon. All right, man, we'll talk to you in one week, and we'll start to size up. I think it'll be Monday Night Football. There has been no flex announcement. Uh, Bears-Vikings, all right? Sounds great, man. See you then. All right, take it easy.